begin the first session. Along with me now, I have Professor Bhai Chandra Puranik. So, he left a bit early yesterday. He had some other meeting. So, now we are ready to take questions. Let me go to NMIT Bangalore. One one zero five NMIT. I think this is the Nikte Minakshi College of Engineering, Bangalore. Over to you, sir. Uh, can you explain the three reservoir? Can you explain three reservoir refrigeration systems? I think uh, you are talking about the three reservoir refrigeration system, right? Is that your question? Ah, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. See our standard thermodynamic understanding of a refrigerator would be a cyclic device. Which absorbs from the cold space the required amount of heat Q 1, rejects it to Q 2, rejects the required amount of heat Q 2 to T 2, which is supposed to be the, at the ambient or slightly higher than that. And we know from our second law of thermodynamics that some work is required to be done. Now, the idea is we already have two reservoirs, one at 1 and one at 2. Uh, let us assume that the work is obtained by running an engine between a high temperature reservoir T 3 and the ambient T 2. Suppose I run an engine which let us say absorbs Q 3 E from some high temperature reservoir, this is greater than ambient. rejects Q 2 E to the ambient reservoir at T 2 and it is adjusted so that it produces a work W. We can link these two work transfer together and this essentially gives us the idea of a 3 T refrigerator. If I consider these two together now, then you will end up with a situation which looks like this. You have a T 3 which is higher than T ambient, then you have a T 2 which is nearly T ambient and you will have a T 1 which is the cold space. Okay. And now, you will have a cyclic device which will essentially have three interactions. It will absorb Q 1 from the reservoir at T 1 that is the refrigerated space. It will absorb Q 3 E as shown here. I am just combining from the hot reservoir and from the ambient reservoir to the ambient reservoir, it will reject Q 2 as well as Q 2 E. So, Q 2 plus Q 2 E. And this is a 3 T refrigerator. When you apply second law to this, the appropriate uh, relation to apply is the Clausius inequality. And the Clausius inequality applied to this would mean the heat absorbed divided by the temperature at which it is absorbed. So, Q 1 by T 1 plus second one is Q 3 E T 3 plus this is heat rejected. So, I write this as minus Q 2 minus Q 2 E divided by T 2. 
this has to be less than or at most equal to 0. This is the Clausius inequality which should be satisfied for such a refrigerator to work. Over to you. COP, sir. Okay. Uh, now, since you understand that this is a combination of an engine and a refrigerator, consequently you can have a COP of sort for the refrigerator part, you can have an efficiency for the engine part. So, this is one situation because in principle there is no work required, we do not have the standard COP, but even then uh, people define, uh, I think it is getting cluttered, but let me try to go down. A COP based purely on thermal interactions can be defined as what we need to extract that is Q 1 divided by what we need to provide as the driving energy source that is Q 3 E. This is a thermal COP. Notice that our normal efficiency or the sorry the normal coefficient of performance is the ratio between a heat flow rate and a power absorption rate. But this COP is purely thermal, it is the ratio of two different heat flow rates. Okay. Over to you. Heat pump and reversible heat pump, sir. No, if you if you want it reversible, then the equality should hold. And then under that condition you can determine the ideal value of this thermal COP that will depend on T 2, T 3 and T 1. So, although our interactions in the definitions are only with T 1 and T 3, the ideal thermal COP will have T 2 also involved in it. From this equation and the first law requirement that Q 1 plus Q 3 E must equal q 2 plus q 2 e. You can eliminate the one which does not appear here that is q 2 and obtain an expression for the thermal COP in terms of t 1, t 2, t 3. That is a half a page of algebra which you can do yourself. Over to you. Sir, in a property relation you have shown the area equivalence in PV diagram and PS diagram sir. Uh, can you hold your mic slightly below? I did not hear you properly. Okay, sir. In the property relation, sir. Huh. Yes. As per the first law, you told that area of PV diagram is equal to area of TS diagram. But about the arrow mark, how it will be, sir? Or they are in the same arrow mark or something? See, the area, uh, I think this is one of those uh, major things which all of us should remember is this. First, let us have a process in the PV diagram. Okay. If it is a PV diagram, then a process on the PV diagram naturally represents a quasi static process and the area under this diagram will be expansion work. If the corresponding process, say this is state 1, this is state 2, if the corresponding representation of the same process on the T s diagram is something like this, quasi static process, so you will have it as a continuous curve. Then the area under the curve is integral T d s, okay. but that is not equal to d q. This is that is not equal to the heat interaction, because second law says that the heat interaction uh, d s is greater than or equal to d q by t. So, t d s will be greater than or equal to d q. So, integral of t d s will be greater than or equal to q. That means, even if you have a process which is adiabatic that is q equal to 0, 
it is likely that the area under this curve is positive. If it were a reversible process, then naturally for a reversible process, this will hold. Now, extending this to a cycle, if I have a cycle on the PV diagram and its corresponding depiction on the TS diagram, the same thing will hold. For a cycle, this is the work done by the expansion mode through that cycle and this is integral cyclic integral of T d s for the cycle. Okay. So, this will be by our relation greater than or equal to the total heat absorbed in the cycle. Okay. Assuming both are quasi static, once I show a continuous line the only assumption I need to make is quasi static. But if the cycle is reversible, then and of course, we are considering a fluid that means a simple compressible system, then the only reversible mode of work is W expansion. In that case, this becomes W. By second law equality, this becomes Q. And since we know W work done in a cycle is the heat absorbed, net heat absorbed in the cycle, they have to be equal. Our uh, Maxwell's relations are based on this equality and the mathematical properties of Jacobian. Over to you. PV diagram for the reciprocating compressor. PV diagram for the reciprocating compressor, uh, I think you should look up a textbook because all I understand is the PV diagram of the reciprocating compressors can be idealized, but under certain conditions. It, all, it also depends on where the valves are set and whether there is a cutoff and all those. Those are interesting diagram, you should look at uh, books. And if you want still more interesting diagrams, PV diagrams, look up the old steam engines book. You will have many more interesting PV diagrams out there. Over to you. So we have we, we have questions. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, sir, can thermodynamics laws be applicable to our biological systems like human heart, sir? Can we consider, consider it as an uh, yes. open system? Yes. First thing is all biological systems are necessarily open systems because we consume food, we throw out waste stuff, we perspire, we breathe in and we breathe out. So, uh, all biological systems are open thermodynamic systems and since thermodynamics is applicable wherever our standard laws of physics and chemistry are applicable. So, they are applicable even to biological systems. Having said that, biological systems are very, very complex systems. The structure is not as simple as just a collection of molecules as in a gas or a liquid or a solid. So, uh, applying it to biological systems which are never in equilibrium and which are complex system is very difficult. But yes, thermodynamics is applicable to biological system. We may not have the ability to apply it as properly to biological systems as we can apply it to engines and refrigerators and fluids and maybe even combustion systems. Okay. If you really want to uh, uh, check out on this and discuss this, there is an old book by I, I think uh, Schrodinger on uh, thermodynamics of biological systems. It is either one of those two famous people have written it, either Heisenberg or Schrodinger. I have seen it the, in the library of uh, the TIFR in Mumbai. Over to you. Sir, since human heart acts like, uh, sir, since human heart acts like a pump, can second law of thermodynamics be applicable, sir? What is your question? Since human heart acts like a pump, sir. Since yeah, okay, the human heart, I think in the discussion forum also there was a question. Yes, the human heart is a pump, but it is a biological pump. So, if we, uh, the fluid mechanics of the human heart is very well known. 
and using ultrasonic mapping the detailed uh, volumetric efficiencies and all that have been experimentally determined okay that uh, what they call ejection fraction and all that thing all pathologists do it absolutely routinely but how is the energy converted from uh, food particles or carbohydrates or whatever it is into that that is not yet fully uh, perfectly assimilated but yes it is a pump it works like a proper pump and hence laws of thermodynamics are applicable to it but remember that it is a biological system over to you can we call uh, the uh, the heart uh, is it a pmm1 no there is nothing in uh, our real world which is pmm of any kind 1 2 or whatever you uh, t care to define the energy input for the heat for the heart the energy input to the heart is the uh, chemicals provided to it through blood and lymph indirectly through our food it doesn't have to be a thermal pump or something which consumes uh, normal work input over to you physical significance of a cutoff ratio in a diesel engine sir hey this is something to do with energy conversion we should not worry about it in thermodynamics thermodynamics we say give us the cutoff ratio give us the model for combustion process we analyze it further the cut off ratio will depend on the type of fuel the way the engine is cooled the way the engine is run engine technology beyond thermodynamics over to you so what is the third law of thermodynamics sir we haven't talked about any third law of thermodynamics so i will not say anything about it i think i should now go to some other center the people here are asking me to switch so thank you for this longish interaction 1150 ghodavat institutions atigre kolapur over to you hello go ahead good morning sir good morning uh, sir in a what situation cp can be equal to cv uh, for a thermodynamic processor or a gas uh, first thing is cp and cv have nothing to do with a thermodynamic process cp and cv are properties of a fluid okay and if you go to the uh, exercises thing i think if all of you do all the exercises uh, properly uh, you will not ask many of these questions go to exercise pr.3 in which you have to show that cp minus cv is function of only p v and t of course in terms of uh, partial derivatives okay so anything on the right hand side if it turns out to be zero there will be no difference between cp and cv okay uh, you can rewrite the right hand side in terms of the compressibility or the bulk modulus and you can show that if the compressibility is very low or if the bulk modulus is very high then uh, cp becomes approximately equal to cv that is cp minus cv will turn out to be zero and if you substitute the ideal gas equation of state on the right hand side you will get cp minus cv equal to r over to you yes sir uh, sir when you are considering the effective heat utilization by the uh, insertion of uh, the devices like economizer or any other device mm. then how we are changing the thermodynamic cycle sir uh, in the sense when there is no economizer what is the thermodynamic cycle and with the insertion of effective heat utilization device that is economizer how will be the change in the thermodynamic cycle and see the the on the on our the ts diagram for a rankine cycle the economizer process is a part of the normal process from 
pump exit to uh, boiler exit. Okay. It is the a detail in the uh, minor detail or detail in the way in which the heat is supplied through various uh, areas in the boiler to the feed water which is getting heated and boiled. So, our T s diagram does not change whether you have an economizer present or economizer not present over to you. Okay, sir, means we are not considering economizer into the… No, if economizer is there, uh, the enthalpy rise in the economizer will be included in the our Q dot supply. See, we write for our boiler Q dot supplied is mass flow rate into H at boiler exit minus H at boiler inlet. And this Q dot supplied includes everything that which is supplied in the economizer plus that which is supplied in the evaporator plus that which is supplied in the uh, uh, superheater. Okay. If, you, if you really look at the detail of the boiler as a thermodynamic device, then perhaps we will model the boiler as part uh, partly economizer followed by the water balls, followed by the drum, followed by the superheaters. And in which case we will write individual uh, uh, energy balances or individual implications of first law and if necessary second law for each of these components. When we do the cycle analysis, we do not go into the details of any one of the major components. Over to you. Sir, one more question, sir. In uh, ranking cycle, we require condenser to condense the steam which is coming out from the turbine. Right. Sir, can we send the water, water without a condenser also for, to the boiler? Yeah, uh, to the boiler, okay. You look at yesterday I mentioned in our cycle uh, classification that ranking cycle is a vapor cycle, so multi equipment cycle. And although for large power plants, it is invariably implemented as a closed cycle. Uh, when we have locomotives, we do not want to carry that big condenser and its cooling water or cooling air system around. So, we have an open cycle. We do not have a turbine there, but we have an engine which does not exhaust the steam into a condenser. The steam is exhausted uh, to the ambient. So, the disadvantage is yes, the cycle will work, but then what you are uh, exhausting from the turbine number one will have to come out at ambient pressure or a pressure very near the ambient. Okay. So, if you condense it, you can expand it to a still lower pressure, half of ambient or even much lower than half of ambient depending on how well the condenser is designed and operated. So, you will lose out on some power of the turbine. But uh, the feed pump also will have to now take fresh water, which would be under ambient conditions. That is what the, uh, that is what is done in a steam locomotive. You have a water tank, which is under ambient conditions and the pump pumps it into the uh, shell of the steam engine, which is the boiler drum essentially. Over to you. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, when we are considering the equation for entropy, ds equal to dq by t and for a reversible process, do not forget ds equals dq by t for a reversible process element. Do not just say ds equal to dq by t, that is very dangerous because it is not correct. ds is dq by t reversible, otherwise if you just want to stop at dq by t, you should say ds should be greater than or equal to dq by t. Over. And uh, that T we are considering as uh, what type of temperature sir, atmospheric or final temperature sir? It is the temperature at the interface of the system, at the boundary of the system across which that dq takes place. So, see dq is an interaction, two systems must be involved. Uh, a receiving system which is the system under consideration and some donor system, the source of that dq. Okay. So, look at the, since dq is an interaction, it has to cross the boundary of the system. So, find out the location on the boundary where that dq takes place, find out what its temperature when 
over temperature is or was when the dq takes place and that that is the temperature which goes in the denominator over to you uh, very thank you sir okay. okay over to you sir over and out there are a number of hands raised so what i am going to do now is at any place i think we will restrict to two or at most three questions right 1006 current state of the system, the state of the environment does not enter into their definitions at all. Whereas, uh, availability and exergy although they look similar in format to the Gibbs function or the Helmholtz function, uh, the temperature and the pressure there in availability and exergy is uh, the ambient temperature, ambient pressure. So, they have nothing to do with uh, Helmholtz function and Gibbs function. Over to you. So, what are the significance of isothermal compressibility volume expansivity? For example, if you take uh, uh, mu jt, Joule Thomson coefficient, if it is 0, uh, the ideal gas expansion uh, uh, the during uh, expansion, the temperature change of temperature is equal to 0, and if it is positive, temperature will uh, decrease it is negative temperature will increase. So, likewise any significance is there for isothermal compressibility and volume expansion. See, uh, there is nothing isothermal compressibility just tells us uh, uh, how much do you need to increase the pressure to reduce the volume by a given fraction that is uh, at isothermal conditions that is without changing the temperature of the uh, system. So, there are two compressibilities we define, uh, one is as you said isothermal compressibility partial of V with respect to pressure at constant T 1 over V and we put a negative sign to make it a positive number because all stable materials when pressure increases volume decreases. This is isothermal compressibility and the other one you have is isentropic compressibility. This is related to the speed of sound. This is not directly related to the speed of sound. That was your question about compressibilities. What was the other part that you talked about? Over to you. That is uh, volume expansivity. Volume expansivity. See, the compressibilities consider variation with pressure. Volume expansivity is the uh, expansion coefficient. So, for solids, we have a linear expansion coefficient. Similarly, for uh, uh, fluids, we have the volumetric expansion coefficient. So, there we keep the pressure constant and determine the change in volume, relative change in volume for a specified change in pressure. So, this is you say volume expansivity. We call it the uh, expansion coefficient, volumetric expansion coefficient. Whereas, both these things are compressibilities, reciprocals of compressibility is bulk modulus. It is exactly the reciprocal of this. So, you will have a uh, you will have an isentropic bulk modulus and a and an isothermal bulk modulus. Over to you. If you refer literature, there are n number of equation of states. Yes. For calculating, for example, for calculating uh, uh, thermodynamic properties of 
new fluids, for example, refrigerant mixes, all these things. Mm. How to choose a uh, proper equation of state? Is there any procedure? Or we have to develop a new equation of state for that? No, you do not have to develop a new equation every time. Actually, nowadays I am sure computer programs are available which will fit your data to any uh, type of equations. Usually, with the so called virial equation of state or virial form of equation of state, where you write P V by R T in the form of a infinite series in one or two variables, typically temperature and pressure, that type of an equation is used. And I am sure standard uh, statistical packages are available for you to select the uh, right number of terms and the coefficients of those terms. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Let me go to some other center now. 1 to 1 5, Bajaj Group of Institutions, Akbarpur. Over to you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, I want to ask that what is the difference between the Rankine cycle and the cycle on which the modern steam power plant works? Uh, the basic cycle is the Rankine cycle, but it gets modified with two modifications. The first modification is reheat. The expansion through the turbine is not in one go. So, uh, the high pressure turbine expands it up to some intermediate pressure. Then it is taken again to the boiler where it is heated again at that intermediate pressure and then it goes through the other turbine or the low pressure turbine where it expands up to the condenser pressure. This is one modification. The second modification is that uh, there is uh, regenerative feed heating, typically 5, 6, sometimes 7 rarely feed heaters, which improve the efficiency significantly. The modern Rankine plant is basically a Rankine plant with superheat and with uh, regenerative feed heating. There are no other modifications. There are other pieces of equipment in the cycle which take care of control, safety, start up, sudden change in load and such things. But the basic cycle is the Rankine cycle with superheat and uh, with uh, reheat and uh, regeneration. Over to you. Sir, my next question is, uh, I have seen on TS diagram of any pure plant, the isobars in subcooled region are the two consecutive isobars are near to each other. But when we come to the superheat region, the same two consecutive isobars have large difference. Earlier I thought that it is a case of change in specific heat at high temperatures. But no, if we it assume it is an ideal gas, then see the yeah, your question is in the subcooled region, the various isobars are very near each other on the TS diagram. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple uh, is that in the, in the subcooled region, the liquid is almost incompressible and because of that, there is hardly any effect of pressure. So, you at a certain temperature, if you change the pressure, the entropy varies very little. You can see it from some detailed steam table. And because of this, all the isotherms are all cluttered together. So much so that if you really sketch or uh, plot the TS diagram to scale, you know, particularly at low pressures, you just cannot make out any difference between the isobars. They almost seem to all cluttered up, cluttered up just to the left of the saturated liquid line. Over to you. Sir, my next question to Dr. Bandarkar. Hmm. Sir, how enthalpy deviation lines drawn in the psychometric chart and what their significance? Uh, so, the question was about enthalpy lines on uh, the psychometric chart, and uh, I think I did explain that um, the enthalpy, you know, the simple formula that we use for enthalpy is just uh, Cp times uh, the temperature that is the dry bulb temperature 
and that is because we have taken the reference at 0 degrees and uh, plus uh, the specific humidity multiplied by uh, this HFG at 0 which is 2501 plus uh, Cp times temperature. So all you have to do really is um, um, take a particular edge okay, and vary the T and what you will realize is that as you vary the T that the, for a particular edge uh, you will get different values of omega and thus you plot the constant enthalpy lines. Now as far as uh, what is its significance, it is only in air conditioning processes you need to know how much uh, heat transfer you have to put uh, into the system or take out of the system if you want to achieve your process. So if you are cooling you will need to remove energy from the system and if you are heating and this is in cold climates, you will need to put in energy into the system and uh, it's a very easy way of doing it. Just look up the two states that you want. So you want a particular dry bulb temperature and specific humidity or relative humidity, mark the points and see the difference in the enthalpy lines passing through those and you know what you should be putting in or taking out. That's about it. Thank you. Sir, my next question is to Gaitunde. Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. I am here. Uh, Dr. Gaitunde, sir. Sir, uh, you told us earlier that W net in case of Connaught cycle is very low as W positive and W negative are approximately equal to each other. And we know that efficiency of a cycle is W net upon the total amount of heat input. Mm. So, sir, if W net is approximately equal to zero, then efficiency is also in approximately equal to zero, but we say that between two given thermal energy reservoirs. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you are getting at. See, I did not say W net for the Carnot cycle is negligible. I said W net for the Carnot cycle. See, W net for any cycle is made up of a W plus and a W minus. So W net is uh, W plus minus W minus. All I have said is the ratio of W plus or W minus to W plus is almost equal to 1 for Carnot cycle. So the efficiency of the Carnot cycle does not change. Suppose you have T equals 1000 K here and T equal to say 500 K here. Then the Carnot cycle working between the two, if it takes in say 100 joules from the 1000 K reservoir it will reject 50 joule from the to the 500k reservoir and it will provide you a w net of 50 joule no doubt about it but this w net will be made up of a w plus of something like of the order of say 1000 joule and w minus will be of the order of 950 joule Consequently, a small amount of friction or any excess uh, require, any extraneous requirement will kill this difference and the cycle will not be able to deliver any uh, work output. W net is pretty small compared to W plus. I did not say W net is pretty small compared to this is which is Q1. The relation between Q1 and W net is through the Carnot efficiency which depends only on T1 and T2. It is this ratio that I was talking about, 1000 to 50 or 50 to 1000. Instead of this, we would definitely prefer something like 50 joule made up of W plus equal to say 60 joule and W minus with say 10 joule. This is definitely preferable. Over to you. And this is the last question because I have to go to some other section, other center. Sir, can the value of gamma be 0 and 1? What is the value of? Sir, gamma be 0 or 1? A uh, gamma, uh, if uh, if you consider it ratio of Cp and Cv, I do not think it will go ever to 0 because uh, 
C p and C v are usually of the same magnitude, but yes it can go to 1 if you have uh, very complex molecules in the gaseous form. For example, if you take uh, saturated water vapor at low pressures, uh, gamma turns out to be approximately equal to 1. And for uh, when we say that for incompressible fluids, uh, uh, Cp equals Cv almost exactly. So, for that gamma will be 1 over and now I think it is time for me to go to some other center because where shall we go? Federal. One zero seven seven Federal Institute, Ernakulam. Over to you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, my question is related. My question is related to second law problem SL twelve. Sir, could you just draw the TV diagram of that process showing the saturation curve? Exercise SL12. So, we have a cylinder piston assembly in which there are two stops. When the piston is at the upper stop, it is 3 meter cube. When the piston is at the lower stop, it is 1 meter cube. That means the system volume will always be between 1 meter cube and 3 meter cube, it cannot go outside this range. The second one is the piston mass and atmospheric pressure are such that the piston floats at 500 kilo Pascal. That means, when the system pressure is 500 kilo Pascal, the volume is ready to uh, change at and adjust itself to an appropriate uh, value between 1 meter cube and 3 meter cube. And remember that thing is 500 kilo Pascal. So, the P V diagram will be something like this. P V, this is 1 meter cube, let us say this is 3 meter cube and uh, the pressure at which it will float is in kilo Pascal 500. Okay. Now, uh, that means, the system can take a state at 500 kilo Pascal anywhere on this line. If you try to increase the pressure above 500, it will float up, but will stop at 3 meter cube. If you cool it and bring it below 500, it will go along this line. So, the process if it is a quasi static process will have to be on this solid line, which is shown here. Now, once you understand this, it is initially 1 mega Pascal and 500 degree C. So, 1 mega Pascal means 1000 kilo Pascal. So, it will be uh, the pressure somewhere here. So, the initial state will be something like this. Details you can calculate because you can determine the, uh, the specific volume at 1 mega Pascal and 500 degree C is given. So, using that you can determine the mass and then all of the properties. When it is allowed to cool to 100 degrees C by rejecting the heat to the atmosphere at 30 degrees C. So, at 100 degrees C find out from the process where the state will be and you will find that it comes here, it comes here and maybe then it goes down here finally, giving you a final state here. Uh, I am not sure, but I think the details of this process are there on the uh, coordinators Moodle, otherwise I will try to put them up there in a few days. Over to you. Sure. Sir, could you show the process on the T V diagram along with the saturation lane in the T V diagram, temperature volume diagram along with the saturation curve? Uh, temperature volume diagram, that for that I will have to determine the details and then show it. Otherwise, there, there is no difficulty in showing it on the T V diagram, but on the T V diagram it depends on the process and where the condensation takes place.
here also in T v the link will be between these two, but the we may not have a horizontal line in between because the horizontal line is because of this constant pressure behavior. Sir, I think, sir, I think in, the, in this problem at the end of this uh, first constant volume heat rejection, hmm. the substance is at the wet, wet region. Wet region. Yes, that is possible. You will have to determine what state A is, which is this intermediate state and what state B is, which is this intermediate state. You should not assume that this is a condensation process. Condensation process may begin somewhere here and may continue up to here or up to here. It is not necessary that this constant pressure process is the condensation process. Even the condensation can be partly at constant volume and then remaining partly at constant pressure. Hello? Yes, go so ahead. Consider, consider a wet steam. Consider wet steam having a very low dryness fraction contained in a rigid, rigid container which is which have diathermic wall. A wet okay. steam having low dryness fraction contained hmm. contained in a rigid rigid container hmm. with a diathermic wall. Hmm. If we re, if we if we remove heat from this wet steam, hmm. if we remove heat from this wet steam at constant volume, that is the process. Hmm. At constant volume, actually, if we show the process on the TV diagram, the dryness fraction is increasing. But okay, during okay. the heat rejection process, usually we will expect expect a, a, a decrease in the dryness fraction. So, if, if it will be better if you mark the state of the steam on the TV diagram having, uh, with a very low dryness fraction and showing the uh, constant volume heat rejection process. First thing is you have a constant volume chamber, fixed volume. It has a diathermic wall. So, some Q is possible. Otherwise, it is uh, rigid so, your W expansion is 0. I would expect that the total W is 0 because you are not mentioning any stirrer or electrical work. I hope that is the assumption. And your initial state here is uh, liquid plus vapor. Uh, x near 0. Is that your initial state? Very small dryness fraction over to you. No, okay. Low dryness fraction, not a exactly saturated liquid. You mean, it, is it saturated liquid or is it saturated liquid with some small amount of vapor? Sir, small amount of vapor, small amount of vapor like x is equal to 0 0.1 or like Okay, say x equal to say 0 0.1. Okay. Now, you have it uh, a q across this and what is the process? The process will have to be a constant volume process. So, if you plot it on the PV diagram, uh, and let us say this is the the volume will become fixed, the process can only be like this. So, let us say this is your initial state, state 1. And if you, uh, uh, are you going to supply heat to it or are you going to reject heat to it, reject heat, make it reject heat. Is Q greater than 0 or Q less than 0? Q is negative. Q is negative, okay. Then this is a simple process. This process will be analyzed at delta E is Q minus 0, uh, Q minus W. W is 0 according to our specification. So, M into uh, assuming this to be equal to delta U. So, this will be M into U 2 minus U 1 will be equal to Q. 
So, if q is negative, u 2 will be negative, uh, u 2 will be less than u 1 and then u 2 and v 2 equals v 1 that will give you the final state. Calculate the final state and depending on whether it gets a higher dryness fraction or lower dryness fraction will be determined based on this. My doubt was that uh, the actually if the heat is rejected, if the Q is negative, we will expect a condensation, but here the dryness. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Again, there is an assumption here. When heat is rejected, there is condensation when the pressure is maintained constant. Here you are forcing the volume to be constant. So, do not make a general statement that when heat is rejected, there is condensation. That is true only when the pressure is maintained constant. Here you are saying a rigid container, so you are maintaining the volume constant. During this process, temperature is also not remaining constant, isn't it, sir? Yeah, the temperature will also not change. For example, on this PV diagram, if this is the initial pressure P1, uh, the process may go like this, in which case your dryness fraction will increase, the pressure will decrease. But the final state is given by this rigid containers of V2 equals V1 and the second property which determines the final state is U2 which comes out of the first law. Over to you. So, this is a case, sir, this is a case, this is a, this is a case of phase change with both change in temperature and pressure. Yes, you are right. Over to you. Sir, okay. Okay, thank you sir, that was my Thank you very much.